Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to episode eight of Transforming the Future of Land Management webinar series. My name is Matthew Morris. I'm a land steward with the Duchy of Cornwall, and I'm delighted to be your host today, along with Tim Hopkin, who is the founder of the Land App. We've got two great speakers lined up today with Lucy from LEAF, linking environment and farming, and also uh, Russ from the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. The theme today follows on from last week and focuses on sustainable land management. All this talk of sustainability has got Tim and I thinking about the future and purpose of the webinar series. We hope you found the session so far informative, aspiring and perhaps even challenging. You're one of over 2,000 people that have registered for this series with interests that span the land management sector from the policy to the practical. This is an incredibly diverse and skillful group of a scale that we've not seen before and we sense that now is the time to start putting this amazing group to work. I've been put to work by one of our speakers, Rob Hindle, who recommended that I read this book, uh, Rebel Ideas by Matthew Saeed. It's fascinating stuff. In it, the author warns of the danger of homophily in business, a group of like-minded individuals, birds of a feather if you will, making decisions and forming ideas together. The risk is that you have blind spots based on shared knowledge or experience, or, or as he puts it rather more directly, you have a group of intelligent people being collectively stupid. You get a far better outcome if you have cognitive diversity, a collective brain, a group of people with different ideas, different backgrounds and different perspectives coming together to solve problems. So our thought is this, what about taking you, the audience, a group of people interested in learning more about natural capital and land management, and firstly turning this into a network and then a collective brain for the sector. A brain which can test, shape and improve existing and emerging thinking and can generate, share and promote new ideas. After all, 2000 heads are surely better than one. More on that a little bit later. First, the usual bit of housekeeping. Um, your camera and microphone will remain off throughout the session today. Please use the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you use that to ask questions to our speakers, uh, you can also vote up um, questions as we go along, which just helps me pick the right questions to ask. And you'll also see a chat, bu chat, a chat button. Uh, please use this to talk to either Tim or I with any technical queries on the webinar. And once again, we're going to use, be using Slido. And as we've discovered, uh, the easiest way to use Slido is to have your camera on your phone ready. Uh, and that's just the simplest way of accessing that particular program. Uh, that is enough from me, Tim. Uh, it's over to you uh, to do a bit more intro and to guide us through any technical benefits. Thank you. Brilliant, Matthew. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and as Matthew said, uh, my name is Tim Hopkin and I'm the founder of The Land App, which is an easy to use uh, mapping platform for rural land management um, and helping you get prepared for ELMS, if nothing else. Uh, so it's free and easy to use, so please do head along to our website to see more about what we offer. So as Matt said, yesterday we have two wonderful speakers. We have Russ Carrington from Pasture Fed Livestock Association, who will be presenting uh, on opportunities for farmers making the most of grazing. And also Lucy Bates from Linking um, Environment and Farming, who will be presenting on integrated resilience. But before we start with that, as usual, for those who have attended um, other webinars, we are going to be running a quick interactive survey. And this really follows on from what Matthew was just sharing about this collective brain. How do we work better together? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share a link to everyone through the chat function. Um, so you have two options here. Either click on this link in Zoom, so maybe hit escape on your keyboard, go into the chat function, select the link, and then hopefully that will open up into a web browser where you can then answer the question. Or alternatively, as Matthew just said, um, get your mobile phones out, um, turn the camera on, hover it over this uh, QR code up in the top left-hand corner, and that should open up the link on your phone where you can then answer the question. So the question we have today is, what do you think could be the most powerful thing to come out of a connected rural network, the rural brain? 
education. So this is if everyone is in one place, communicating with one another, working in separate groups, self-organizing in separate groups, allowing conversations to go in all sorts of different directions, what would be the most powerful thing to come out of it? So all of you are going to be welcome to join this um, oh, wow, education. Political cloud, that's very important. There'll be something we share within the channel on that very shortly. So those who join will see that conversation coming alive. Uh, food, innovation, knowledge, lobbying, innovation. Okay, so innovation is coming up more and more. So how can we as a group start innovating and spinning off new companies, new ideas, new products, new a webinar series? Um, Environment coordination, yes, and maybe more coordination at different landscape levels. So grouping into regional collective groups and working out what you can do better in a, in a, in a region. We do actually have those groups available in, in, the, in the channel, which we'll make available for you. So you can select yourself into a region, and then you can start talking with other people in your region about ideas that you could start to generate. So nearly 100 people have, read, have answered it so far. So those who are struggling, just go into the chat open the link or indeed, um, so Simon has just answered the chat, please do just uh, get your phone out and focus that on the QR code or use the link in the chat function. So innovation, education, sustainability, knowledge, lobbying, what else, positive change, so all being part of positive change, sharing ideas with one another and moving, moving the, the sector in a healthy direction. Scale, resilience, innovation, education, food, Rural resilience, sharing best practice. This has come up all through the series. How do we start sharing best practice? How do we start sharing ideas? How do we start getting people moving the way that they're, they're delivering outcomes on the ground? Brilliant. 110, 111 people. You can answer as many times as you want, but I think we're going to draw it to a close in just a second. Resilience, change, innovation, food, lobbying, collaboration. Fantastic. So just so you know, we're going to be sending out a link for people to join this network um, after the webinar today. So you'll all be receiving an email. Please jump in, join the network, introduce yourself to everyone else that's already there and start getting involved in the conversation. So brilliant. We're going to stop that there. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stop now sharing my screen. And Russ, I'm going to hand it over to you. And uh, Russ is going to be presenting on opportunities for farmers making the most out of grazing. So Russ, over to you. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you, Matthew, for the opportunity to present today. Um, really fantastic webinar series, and I've tuned in to a few of them already. Just wanted to say hello uh, to everybody on camera to start with, uh, so you know a face that's uh, speaking, but I will share my screen now, which hopefully you can all see. Uh, so I've been involved with the Pasture Fed Livestock Association since its inception uh, in 2011, but I have been recently stepping back from day-to-day -day involvement and doing a little bit of freelance consultancy as well. But I'm going to take you through today uh, what the organisation is, work, and uh, touch on some of the relevant topics as well, such as, as diets and the environment as well. So I um, hope it's of interest. So uh, hopefully, there we are. So as an organisation, we really work to uh, balance these three important things and what works well on farm as, as farm practice for sustainable land management together with the market for sustainably produced foods and also the science and evidence that supports that as well um, and really trying to find that uh, common middle ground uh, for all those three and as an association we are very much a member-led we're in fact a community interest company um, operating for the membership and at the core purpose has been really promoting uh, pasture fed livestock production and championing and advocating that and we've grown as a community of farmers now to over 600 members stretching right across the UK and also Ireland uh, and our central facet really and uh, core is knowledge sharing and we have a lot of that going on on a online forum where our members are sharing knowledge and experience between one another and it's become extremely powerful for helping uh, farmers to adapt new practices on their farm. So we do supplement things in a normal year, obviously not, not this year with study tours and farm visits where we get an opportunity to go and look around each other's farms and, and learn other. In fact, even though this year we haven't been able to do that, we've been running some uh, interactive 
webinars. We've been doing live farm tours. Uh, we did one earlier this week with a farm in Wiltshire and another in Scotland with those farmers out on their farms walking around the livestock and, and showing us. So we're continuing this, this knowledge sharing as a community uh, even during these times. And also when we can, we would do more uh, work to help farmers learn about creating products that meet the market requirements. So this sort of thing with training with the help of HDB and others. Um, and further to that, one thing we've increasingly been doing is to really to try and uh, lobby government uh, to the importance of sustainable land management and in particular bringing in some of the regenerative farming practices that were mentioned in fact by uh, Jonathan Bruni who's pictured here next to George Eustace on the call last week. Um, but ultimately we've considered who really decides about how the way how we manage our land and is that government or is it us as the farmers but ultimately we concluded that really it's the consumers and it's the consumers that vote when they purchase products they want to be, uh, the manager they really uh, want to see although they may not always realize it but it has a big bearing the market influence has a big bearing on how we manage our land so out of that thought was was born the pasture for life certification mark as a means to um, recognize what we deemed as 100% pasture fed uh, beef, lamb and dairy produce from, from British farms and we created this logo and latterly that became a certification mark protected by the Intellectual Property Office and behind that sits a set of production standards which are developed uh, in tune with the members and in consultation with the members but also in regard to the science and what the science shows uh, produce reared in this way can, can create which I'll, I shall touch on a little bit more. So in effect the standards are asked and that there's no grain or soy or other products fed to uh, animals and, and products that can carry this certification mark and it's being now increasingly used to endorse and verify existing products but also help to endorse existing brands as well and we're seeing it pop up uh, increasingly um, in the UK. And we have now almost 100 certified farmers stretching right across the UK. And I've shown here just a map of some of those that uh, we have live at the moment. We have recently made the certification available in Ireland and have a few uh, farmers working towards certification there as well. What's really interesting looking at this map is just quite how many different environments there are that farmers are working to and, and making the pasture for life system work. And that's a real credit to the farmers as individuals. What we have found is that their approach and their attitude towards land management is really what makes it possible and successful to have 100% um, pasture fed livestock in all of these areas. And we're seeing more and more farmers crop up and, and, and proving that it's possible and finding many benefits to the farming in this way. So what really does it actually look like? Well, it's quite difficult to, to really put a definitive answer on that because there is a great deal of variation, uh, as I mentioned, across the climate. But generally, there tends to be more rotation. There's better management of grazing and those animals tend to be moving around more. And that's not least important for the animals, but more important really is the rest periods that the land gets uh, when it's not being grazed and allowing um, grass plants and other species in the pasture to really uh, grow and thrive and, and put down rooting and uh, flowering and providing a multitude of, of benefits. And so we can start to see practice a little bit like this where there is much more ground cover, uh, much more forage starts to become established on the land and the, the land isn't then overgrazed but it's managed differently. And why we talk about um, pasture fed rather than grass fed is because we find that this image portrays really what, what grass is, but this portrays what pasture is. And for us, pasture has so much more diversity. And that is in fact very important for the balanced diet of animals, but equally uh, good for the environment. And so it's really commonplace for us to see images such as this, where there might be at least 25 different species within uh, the pastures that are providing a biodiverse diet for the animals and equally for the environment. But furthermore, this provides a great deal of benefit below ground because all those different species above ground are providing um, lots of activity below ground that really helps to excite and, and uh, host a very active 
uh, soil ecology. So our farmers are really trying to work and monitor what's happening in their soil because it's such a fundamental part of making this system work successfully. And so using things like the Soil uh, Mentor app can help to monitor what's going on. And it's not always easy to measure particular parameters such as soil carbon, but there's lots of other proxy measures that can be used to monitor soil health. And this can be a really good indicator to what's going on in terms of soil carbon. And in fact, there's a direct correlation between uh, plant diversity and, and increased soil carbon in our pasture land soils. But what does this mean economically for farmers? Well, just to put into context, the, the picture for, for in this example, uh, lowland grazing is that financially uh, most livestock farmers are struggling to make a profit without uh, subsidy. And this presents a real challenge for the industry as a whole. And it's, it's not uncommon, it's been this way for a long time. So we've been really focused on trying to see how how the economics of pasture for life work for farmers adopting this approach. And we produced a booklet called It Can Be Done, which drills down into this using HDB benchmark figures. And we have a new publication of this coming out uh, very soon. And it uses benchmarking figures and shows overall that the lower input costs are, do tend to increase the margin for farmers. And furthermore, if they can sell the product for a premium under the pasture for life label, this increases the margin even more. But really the, the, the core message is that the lower inputs uh, result in, in greater margin. So be remiss of me not to touch on, on diet. And I know that uh, for, for beef farmers and sheep farmers, this uh, the whole diet has uh, diet phases and fads and fashions have been a, a major concern. It's really interesting to see what's, uh, what's been going on in the last 12 months and even how this has changed in more recent months since the COVID-19 lockdown. When we talk to people that are changing the diets or moving away from red meat, it's really interesting to see what their core drivers are and what motivates them to, to make that, that difference. And the one that's most increased really has been around uh, climate change. And uh, in particular, how uh, generally people are led to believe that cows are responsible for climate change and uh, images such as this are becoming quite uh, commonplace. And really, I wanted to tackle that today because really this is based on a, de a degree of misinformation that in fact came from the International Panel for Climate Change, which carried out a study looking at the direct emissions of livestock versus transport. And as we can clearly see here, uh, they worked out that livestock account for 5% of emissions and transport was 14%. But the same study was done as a life cycle analysis, looking at uh, all that goes into producing livestock and processing of the subsequent feed or milk and what have you. And the same for transport, the harvesting of oil and manufacturing refinement, the burning of the fuel, and then, and then the uh, scrapping and uh, processing of transport thereafter. And they worked out for livestock that this was 14 and percent of emissions, but no one's yet figured out the figure for transport. Um, but of course, what's ended up happening is that this 14.5% for life cycle emissions has been uh, compared to the 14% of direct emissions of transport. And therefore, people come to the conclusion that uh, livestock, in fact, has a higher, uh, higher emissions than, than transport, which, of course, we know doesn't make sense. So uh, as a group, we very much see that livestock are a very key part of the carbon cycle. And in fact, they are the very tool that helps to drive that cycle uh, in, in nature and on, on our farms. And I have to credit uh, Smiling Tree Farm for this, this great illustration, which shows some of the interactions of carbon uh, in a pasture system and how that cow is so central to all that goes on there. And of course, this system only really works when the inputs are minimalized or, or even excluded altogether which is another reason when we developed the pasture for life standards that they were 100% pasture fed and grain free, minimizing the inputs of this natural carbon cycle and keeping it cycling for perpetuity. What we're now finding is that there's more research coming out and recognizing that methane from uh, livestock units is, is different to methane produced from the burning of fossil fuels and starting to compare those differently. And methane from, from ruminant animals has been, uh, 
has been around for a long time, but it also degrades over time. So there should be no net increase of, of methane from ruminant animals. And it's more the human induced fossil fuel burning that we should be more concerned about. But of course, it's taking time to get this message out and uh, overcome the misinformation. So I also wanted to continue touching on diet really and uh, also another driver for people to turning away from red meat is what they believe it's, it's done for diets maybe impacting their health and there's a very good authority in Dr Zoe Harkham worth looking up on many things in this field but just to mention specifically the benefits that we're starting to measure for pasture for life produce is that it does in particular appear to be much higher in omega-3 and this is a particularly sought after nutrient for humans because we cannot create it ourselves it's very difficult for us to get in fact from from much of our diets as well except from things like oily fish where you might have heard of omega-3 but 100 percent pasture fed uh, beef lamb and dairy produce is also very high in omega-3 and so a great thing to have part of your diet and this really comes from the complex proteins that exist plants to help them photosynthesize and ruminant animals, the specialist animals for processing this otherwise hard to digest leaf green leafy material with their four stomachs can turn this into uh, products that are of use to us, be that meat, milk or leather and wool. And it's no surprise therefore that a lot of those, uh, that diet influences their uh, milk and meat composition in particular the omega-3s. And Research from the United States shows how the introduction of grain to the diet of cattle in this particular case uh, very quickly drops away. This is showing three particular types of omega-3s and how they are impacted with the introduction of grain in the diet. We've also been working with Newcastle University who've done some work uh, on pasture for life milk and they are finding that the ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 and the, and the lower the better in that case uh, is also helped with a 100% pasture fed diet and you can see here on the left the results of that uh, even at an even lower ratio than what is found in organic produce and furthermore the conventional and I should say at this point that we are not critical whatsoever of other farming systems we're, we're just sharing what we're finding and the differences we're seeing in comparison to other farming systems and this is a very key point for selling to consumers and how we market products that carry uh, good nutrition. And I wanted to touch on that market very briefly before I finish in, in, to share some of the uh, Google statistics for people sharing uh, or, or searching for uh, grass fed online. And we can see from Google, and, and these are freely available for anyone to look up on particular search terms, how that in the UK, the searching for grass fed has greatly increased. We can look at the same thing in the UK comparing grass-fed beef and organic beef and we see that the searching for grass-fed beef has very quickly caught up the searches for organic beef and for many years now has in fact been running somewhat in parallel. We can take this a step further and look at it globally and in fact the searches for grass-fed beef have really uh, taken off and, and far beyond searches for organic and we're particularly seeing the activity in the USA in this in this case but also now increasingly around the world where more consumers are looking for uh, grass-fed beef and other grass-fed products found in a way that they feel is in tune with what they want to buy into. So our final challenge really is as an organization is, is breaking through the supply chain and finding routes to market and it's certainly not easy to do this because there are so few uh, points in the middle, usually in the case of abattoirs, uh, in, in beef supply chains, there are so few points it's quite difficult to get a product through when those uh, abattoirs are in the hands of quite a few. And so there's been quite a, a move to how we can address that as a community of farmers and there are initiatives such as a mobile abattoir being explored to help uh, create new supply chains for, for our farmers. But fundamentally it's difficult pushing a product uphill pushing it through a supply chain through a narrow point. So as an organization, we're restructuring and changing our focus now to the right hand side, to the final customer, the consumer, and trying to generate more of a pull. If we get the customer pulling the product into the market, the supply chain infrastructure will respond and allow those products to flow through. So you might have seen, we've done a short video promoting Pasture for Life as a group of farmers to really and captivate the uh, consumer, get them looking for the product, looking where to buy it, 
and in turn that helping to drive a change in the way farmers manage the land and a move to war towards more sustainable land management in, in the way that we see it regarding beef, lamb and dairy production. So that's in a very quick nutshell what we're all about. Please do visit the website and look up any more information you wish or drop me a line if you'd like to ask any questions and do follow us on social media where we'll be sharing some more of our webinars in due course. So uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much, Tim. Wonderful. Thank you very much for us. A really informative talk about you know, the real benefits of what it is to have pasture-fed livestock. So thank you so much for that. Uh, next, we have Lucy um, from LEAF, who is going to be presenting on integrated resilience. Lucy, over to you. Hi, Tim. Hello. It's, um, I'll just start again with a, with a bit of FaceTime and say hello, and then I'll share my screen in a moment of slides. Um, it's really lovely to be here. Thank you so much to Tim and Matthew for hosting this whole series. I've, I've really learned a lot and hugely appreciated the insights into land management approaches and practice across the really wide range of sectors that they've been showcasing to us here. What it's brought to my mind is both the diversity and the commonality of the context that we're all working in. Let me now share my screen with you. And perfect, we've got it, Lucy. So you got it. Yep. Okay. Right then. Shall I turn off my video so it doesn't use up too much life force? Okay. So today I'm going to be presenting to you on leaf, which is linking environment and farming for those of you who might not have come across this particular acronym before. Our approach specifically to environmental farmland management and the experience that we are bringing to the ELMS design process. Given that we are about a whole farm approach that integrates all elements of an agroecosystem, I really hope this also finds residents with the foresters, woodsmen, conservationists, ecologists, food processors, community workers and educationalists among you. So my role at LEAF is as ELMS project coordinator giving me the great privilege of looking forwards into and hopefully helping to shape the future of UK land management, while also building on 29 years of experience in the delivery of environmental land management and associated public goods by LEAF farmers. Although I know that some of you are old friends and colleagues of LEAF, some of you might never have heard of us. Others of you might have encountered or worked with us in one area without realising what else we do. So I'm going to briefly explain here what we do do, how we do it, and what we see it as bringing to the future of UK land management. I've titled this talk Integrating Resilience, as this invaluable attribute is what I see LEAF's work bringing to the systems it works within. Our remit is, and always has been, to deliver more sustainable food and farming by working with farmers, the food industry, scientists and consumers to inspire and enable farming that is prosperous, enriches the environment and engages local communities. The clues in the name, by linking a diverse and functioning in the environment to agricultural productivity, we highlight and enhance the interdependence of each, making for a system that is more than some of its parts. We do this through three main pillars of work facilitating knowledge exchange and generation, public engagement and education, and developing market opportunities for sustainably farmed crops. The overriding principle that is promoted, supported, and advanced by LEAF in every area of our work is integrated farm management, or IFM, encompassing nine interrelated areas of farm management. Soil health and fertility, crop health and protection, animal husbandry, water management, energy efficiency, pollution control and byproduct management, organisation and planning, landscape and nature conservation, and community engagement. Tenets of this system thinking include that it is size specific, no one size fits all, that it entails continuous improvement and is an ongoing process, even the best can get better, and that it is a whole farm approach a framework and a way of thinking that promotes best practice across all areas and enterprises of a farm. Attention to detail, giving incremental but integrated improvements to the triple bottom line to collectively deliver tangible economic, environmental and social benefits across the farmed landscape. 
Looking at these areas in more detail is firstly knowledge generation and exchange takes place through our network of 39 as of this morning and very soon to be 40 demonstration farms which showcase IFM in action across sectors. The network also consists of 11 affiliated innovation centres made up of a range of research establishments which underpin the continuous improvement with ongoing research into relevant areas of the agricultural sciences. I think this is a pretty cool list personally. We have partnered in joint research projects in areas including crop diversification, sustainable intensification, integrated pest management, food waste reduction and of course the ELMS test and trials programme. The public engagement that LEAF might be most familiar to you through is the annual LEAF Open Farm Sunday event, which we've managed since its inception in 2006. Over 1,600 farmers across the UK have opened their gates and welcomed over 2.5 million people onto farms for one summer Sunday each year, facilitating great advances in public understanding of the nitty gritty of food production. The fact that farm visits are off the cards this June hasn't put us off. The 7th of June will instead see an online schedule of live interviews and articles from farms across the UK covering every aspect of the industry and with the physical event itself currently postponed until the 20th of September. Leaf Education acts as a catalyst and facilitator for the connection of working farmers directly with classrooms, instigating the understanding and communication critical to future relations between producers and consumers on every level. A team of regional education consultants delivers accredited training for farmers and teachers in the provision of high quality educational farm visits through the CVAS qualification. Through partnerships that provide a wealth of online resources such as Countryside Classroom and Farmer Time, which uses FaceTime as a platform for direct communication between farm and school, teachers are supported to confidently deliver a positive agricultural agenda against the required curriculum milestones. Check out Farming Fortnights running from Monday the 1st to the 12th of June, so that's starting next week, on social media in partnership with Brockwell College in Kent. This was developed as a response to teenager-focused research in 2018. The different hashtag theme daily from Mooing Monday, Woolly Wednesday, Feathered Friday, but really focusing on careers and opportunities across the spectrum of the farming sectors. Thirdly, and crucially, for the thriving and productive sector that we all seek, developing market opportunities. We manage the Leaf Mark Assurance Scheme, a robust standard re represented by a logo that hopefully you may well recognise, certifying produce that's been grown by farmers who are committed to environmental improvement. It's accredited by ISEAL and independently expected, inspected. Leaf Mark producers are audited annually against a set of control points that are regularly reviewed to reflect best practice in each and every area of IFM. Leaf Mark producers hold earned recognition status with the Environment Agency, being less likely to, un to undergo inspection as the risk their farming poses to the environment is shown to be reduced. I think these are pretty good set of stats myself. 43% of fruit and veg grown in the UK in 2019 was LeafMark certified, and the standard covers over 358,000 hectares of crop across 936 businesses in 27 countries. The global nature of this standard, we believe, answers a critical need in providing a mechanism whereby the high environmental and welfare standards that are valued on UK farms can be transparently matched in imported equivalents to facilitate parity of responsible trade. A recent success for LeafMark is that the states of Jersey have fully adopted LeafMark as their agro-environmental standard. Jersey is now the first fully LeafMark island in the world. All milk produced on Jersey is LeafMark certified, and the Jersey Royal Potato Company launched this very morning as our first international demonstration farm with a fitting online fanfare. For those of you interested in the conversation surrounding certification, and there's many for those of you who are into that kind of thing, LEAF will be hosting a lunchtime roundtable discussion as part of the Land Up series, the ongoing um, uh, lunchtime roundtable series looking at how LeafMark and other assurance schemes have had to be nimble to adapt to coronavirus and the changes in the food supply chain while still delivering robust and credible sustainably farm produce. How we take this forward into future approaches to risk-based assurance, encouraging continual improvement will be explored.
Caroline Drummond, our chief, our chief executive, will be chairing conversation between a range of actors in the assurance space, as farmers, advisors, and schemes themselves. Watch this space for more information. We also believe that Leafmark has an important role to play in the future of the ELM scheme, and I'll explain more about now about our involvement in this process. So, our participation in the ELMS Tests and Trials Programme and the associated stakeholder engagement that's the main focus of my role at LEAF and touches on all three pillars of work through four trials. The opportunity this affords us to contribute to the evolution of this next phase of the interdependent relationship between land managers and the majority, actually, of the population who occupy different roles in the same economic nation is one that we really appreciate. The conversation is not always an easy one, of course, with diverse agendas and entrenched expectations on all sides, but it is one that's happening and it's happening fast, and LEAF is embracing the opportunity to be part of it. It's an opportunity I'm sure you'd agree that none of us can afford to miss. As, among other things, the representatives of a network of farmers who've been working within a management framework which is already delivering outcomes that clearly reflect the stated public goods we are able to offer the benefit of experience in transition towards farming systems that work for businesses without comprising the resilience of the wider agroecological networks that they depend on. The integration of all aspects of land management to give a synthesis of outcomes that are more than the sum of their parts places IFM and leaf farmers working knowledge of it firmly in the forefront of positive change, however this is ultimately packaged in terms of policy and finance. For instance, as IFM is a categorically whole farm approach and leaf marked businesses are audited on this level, they have extensive experience of putting together what are essentially a form of land management plan. This key aspect of ELMS, intended to be the mechanism by which farms lay out what public goods they are able to deliver and present the outcomes of their management decisions, is still under, under design and the Demonstration Farm Network is contributing their experience to this through two of our trials. The first of these, which concluded in February, used the trial of a biodiversity monitoring app as a platform for discussion of the appropriateness of apps for self-assessment of public goods delivery and, indeed, of self-assessment itself for outcomes-based payments. If anybody's interested in reading it, contact me and I'll happily let you have a copy of the final report. The second is gathering together the tools and knowledge exchange platforms that support demonstration farmers in modelling, monitoring, management and mapping for planning and verifying the whole farm delivery of demonstration standard IFM and associated public goods. These include the Leaf Sustainable Farming Review, an annual self-assessment tool addressing each area used by all leaf farmers and more. By building on their collective knowledge and insight along Side that of other established farming systems which address sustainability issues that ELM is approaching afresh, the LMP could save itself years of rocky reinvention of the wheel to the benefit of all. LEAF Education is running a trial which builds on its experience of connecting schools and farmers through evaluating the established CVAS training programme for delivery of the public good of engagement and education. Our fourth and largest trial is exploring the role of advice in helping land managers move towards leafmark assurance as a proxy for environmental enhancement of farm practice. 60 farms are engaged in this trial, representing a full sectoral and geographical spread across the whole land, each being supported by one of three training, advice and support packages for which outcomes will be compared in the new year. In addition to offering our experience and findings into the mix, however, and indeed learning from those of our colleagues across the Tests and Trials programme, there is another aspect to our engagement with the ELMS design process which will be familiar to many of you here who have spent decades and indeed whole careers working towards environmental consideration in all land management contexts. Improvement of outcomes is of course vital and timely across the piece, but recognition of the work already taken and systems put in place by farmers and land managers who have pioneered and progressed regenerative agricultural systems such as IFM is also prescient. Highlighting the positive contribution of good agriculture to a thriving and productive agroecosystem has been LEAF's work for nearly 30 years and we believe that this exciting new era of policy change widens and broadens participation in this conversation. 
We look forward to progressing this conversation together with both our existing expanding network and yourselves, our colleagues across the diverse sector that is land management. There's a lot we don't know about what's coming next, but we do know that the resilience inherent to well integrated systems has never been more important than now. Whatever elms look like, we believe farmers who are working to address the triple bottom line of economic, social and environmental metrics will, as ever, be best placed to thrive alongside the land. Thank you. And please feel free to ask questions. Lucy, thank you very much. That was an incredibly interesting overview. I can see a lot of questions for you in the Q&A. So, yeah, if anyone does have any questions for Lucy, please do feel free to ask. Um, so we're now going to go into our second uh, round of the interactive surveys. Both Russ and Lucy have a question that they would like to ask you. So I'm, I'm just going to do, uh, firstly, I'm going to send out Russ's. So I'm going to share the link on the chat function firstly to everybody. There we are. And um, jump into present mode. So if, if anyone um, has an alternative to using the link, please do get your phone out and just hover the camera over the QR code up in the top left. So Russ's question is, how does the consumer connect with the values of sustainable land management? We know it's the consumer's education again. Um, so um, we know that the, the change in the system is going to be driven or drawn by the, um, the consumers who are paying money in the shops. So how does the consumer connect with the value of sustainable land management? Labelling, so that maybe comes up to Adele's um, point in the first uh, webinar that we did. Um, social media, so much more of a social media campaign about the quality of or the importance of the quality of sustainable land management. Labelling, making sure that there's transparency in the supply chain, again, hugely important. Um, maybe we can put our rural brain on that topic in the, in the forum. Um, social media, education, labelling, media storytelling. So if anyone's got any ideas about storytelling, again, that'd be fascinating to bring up in the, in the rural brain forum because we want to work out, do we do, you know, mini, um, a mini uh, sort of animated series? Do we do infographics? How do we present this information? Price, also hugely important, that's coming up as well. More stories, visiting farms. I'm sure visiting farms and story, uh, storytelling comes together and social media and labelling. Again, if anyone's got any ideas for how we um, evolve our case studies on our website, we would love to make those more live, more real, uh, more connected to the farm. Um, so, yeah, it'll be the rural brain that these ideas start getting bounced around in. So very much looking forward to that. Okay, great. I think we'll give it another five seconds. Remember, anyone who's answering, you can answer as many times as you want. So if there's a few things on your mind, please feel free to share them. Great. We will now switch over to Lucy's question. Okay, so thanks for everyone who answered that. So I'm going to activate Lucy's. Again, share the link back through the chat function. So you can either use it there. So the second link that I've just sent through is Lucy's. And I'm going to go into present mode. Um, so alternatively, yeah, get out your camera, focus it on the QR code. So Lucy's question is, what words do you associate with LEAF? So this is a question that LEAF have. They want to know how do people associate with what LEAF actually is? So sustainable environment, integrated farm management, IFM, organic, open farm Sunday, arable longevity, whole farm. That's a very important point. Government, Caroline Drummond's coming up. Okay, environment is front and center, open farm Sunday, sustainability, integrated farm management, Caroline coming up strong. Okay. Brilliant. Just remember, that those who are answering, you can answer as many times as you want, so please do feel free to get uh, your thoughts out. Brilliant. Yes, I mean, environment front and center. Lucy, I hope you're, you're seeing this. Um, and all of these answers we, get, we make available on our website. So those who join, you know that you can easily jump across into our website and see all the, uh, these answers that have come out. So if you want to do any research afterwards. We've also got an amazing volunteer, Philippa, who's writing um, blogs on a lot of this. So she's synthesizing all of these different bits that people are inputting and turning into really concise blogs. So please do run across to the, check those blogs out and um, leave comments there. Brilliant. I think we'll leave it there. There we go. I think that's very clear. Environment is front and center. 
Brilliant. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, also, just quickly, there was a few questions. A lot of people were asking what was the book that Matt was referring to right at the beginning. Beginning, It's Rebel Ideas, and I'm going to send this link through the chat function so you can all go and purchase a copy yourself. And I'm also going to send a link through for our Slack channel, this forum that we've been discussing today. So if you want, you're welcome to sign up now. Otherwise, we're sending an email out later this afternoon that you'll uh, give you all the information about it and another opportunity to sign up. So I'm going to stop sharing, and um, Matthew will hand it back over to you. Thanks, Tim. Sorry, just having a few uh, technical issues. Let's try and start my video. There we go. Good. Great. Uh, well, lots of questions have flown in um, for both speakers. So, uh, Russ, if I could, uh, if I can start with you. Um, I've got uh, got a couple of joint questions as well, but uh, let's start with Russ. Uh, so, um, Pasture for Life produce. Is there a premium for it, and how does this compare with, for example, organic produce? Yeah, so a really good question, something I get asked a lot, and it's quite difficult to put a finger on that. It's not like we have a, a national premium that exists for everybody, and that premium is, is uh, quite hard earned in some cases, and it really depends on the success of that supply chain, and it can come in different forms. But by and large, yes, there is a premium for the product, but that will depend on the relationship that is developed between the farmer and the butcher in that particular supply chain. In comparison to organic, for example, um, it can in some times be close to organic. And if a product is both organically certified and pasture for life certified, that tends to be seen as a real gold standard. And so it tends to be a, a small premium over and above organic with that as well. Brilliant. And um, in terms of uh, the outlets, then, I mean, it sounds like you know there's a there's a mixture of um, sort of outlets that you're working with. I mean, have you got any sort of uh, pointers for people that might like to go and buy it um, uh, today, where, where, where might they like to look? Sure, yeah, so um, we've got a where to buy page on the Pasture for Life website that people can head over to. I will say though that in the past three months during lockdown, that page has been extremely busy and some of our farmers with farm shops or direct outlets or the supply chains have been noticing a four or five fold increase uh, in sales during the last few months. So it's been actually a really positive time for our farmers that have been able to experience and actually engage a market that have otherwise not been shopping with them. So we hope that trend continues. Yeah. Uh, and you talk, you talked about the sort of confusion and sort of mixed messaging that's going on, particularly around emissions uh, from agriculture and the different metrics that are being used. Uh, how does the industry counter uh, this mixed messaging, how does it counter the sort of very slick and well orchestrated sort of anti livestock lobby that exists? Uh, what, what's the solution to Apocalypse Cow? Yeah, it's really a really difficult one. And I think we actually really need to work together as a whole industry to, to tackle this one and tackle the misinformation. Um, we're slightly up against it because a lot of those messages do appear to be quite well funded. There's some real corporate interests in. Uh, in alternative foods and um, the in terms of ingredients for uh, plant-based foods that are that are imitated to be meat replicas the ingredients are very cheap the margins are very high so the companies invested in producing that those products have a lot to gain so they really drive the advertising and we need to be acutely aware of that and how we can work together to to tackle it head on really but not in, a, in an aggressive way but I think by consistently showing what British agriculture is delivering, what, what British livestock do do, the wider benefits they bring to the environment uh, for water retention, the landscape to help with droughts, flooding and many other things. And I think we can add value to our products in that way, not just in terms of food on, on the shelf. Yeah, I mean, it, it would seem, you know, like we should build on all the good things that have, you know, particularly particularly as you're talking about sort of local produce and you know, the farm shop retail side that's, that's experienced this boom in the last few weeks you know it'd be nice to try and capture that momentum and and, and take it forwards yeah um, we do sorry just to come back on that Matthew we, we do need evidence as an industry to demonstrate for example what we're sequestering in terms of carbon and what we're delivering in, in terms of other pe public goods um so I think that's again something for us to, to as an industry to uh, get a hold of and, and have the evidence to counter some of yeah the, I mean it yeah. sort of segues me nicely into my next question actually which is uh do you have any views on the, the sort of various carbon assessment tools that are available for farming systems at the moment? I mean, some don't seem to recognise 
uh, so sequestration, uh, others do. do. Do you have any thoughts as to, as to how we tackle that? Yeah, it's a tricky one um, and different soil types can really impact um, carbon sequestration as well and so it's a highly complex subject. There are a, a few different um, calculators out there. One that is quite often used by our members is the Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit which has really been developed a lot with the feedback and the science and understanding of what's possible. But I would say there's so many other measures to monitor soil health and in particular for farmers it's really important that they, they are monitoring those soil health um, measures regularly themselves because better soil health will, will increase productivity and profitability. Brilliant, thank you. Ross, I'm going to uh, turn to Lucy now if I may. Sure. Um, I'll come back for a joint question at the end. Lucy, Hi. thank you. Hi. Um, so just thinking about LEAF as an organisation, what, what do you feel is the most important component of it? What's the most important part of LEAF? Well, it, it's really, as I've got to know the organisation better, it's really amazed me how diverse um, and, and how wide reaching it is. There's, there's only about 25 of us. It employs less people than I thought it did before I started working here. Um, and I'm going to tell you that they are integrated. They, they're really um, leaning on each other. They really cross over. There's no part of the organisation that I, as part of the technical team, don't interact with on, on a daily, if not weekly basis. So they're equally important as each other. Excellent. Good answer. Um, so just thinking about some of the themes that we've already covered in our webinar series, one of them is, is talking about landscape scale uh, management uh, and the benefits that that can bring. Mm -hmm. Do you see that IFM can, can be used at a landscape scale um, you know, with groups of farmers and landowners? It's a really good question and it's a really um, a current one actually. It's a good one to ask us right now um, for two reasons. Firstly, because we, we have always felt very positive about, about LEAF as a kind of diversified cluster aware that we're scattered you know we have a strong cohort that, that crosses a lot of sectors but is geographically fairly spread out however we've got two particular moments that have come about for us over the last couple of years one is jersey so that's really exciting that's a really interesting example of an area that is where, where ifm is, is covering the land um, and the other is we're, we're involved in penwith with the cornwall wildlife trust um, we're just at the beginning of a three-year project whereby we're looking at a much more um, cohesive regional cluster in Penwith and just taking a, a group of farms, a, a contingent group of farms through to Leafmark. So really exciting. And I think, yes, I think integrated landscape management very much fits in with integrated farm management and then all, all the integrated crop management, integrated pest management. That's, that's part of it. And that's, I think that's where we're looking at going forward. Brilliant. We're um, just just thinking about the, the the sort of I suppose the certification side of things. Um, one slide that you put up noted that I think fifty percent of leaf mark farms are carrying out all aspects of IFM. Um, perhaps just a comment on um, the sort of most and least popular uh, aspects of uh, of that, and um, and and how many how many aspects have to be satisfied for you to get full certification. Okay, I think there's a bit of either a typo or a misreading there because I think that slide actually said IPM. I think we'll find that it's the of, of that stat is that leaf farmers will, will be carrying out fifty over fifty percent were carrying out eight all eight of the IF, IPM aspects okay. to put the best practice. IFM every point in the control standards must be met to become certified. Brilliant. OK, thank you yeah. for clarifying that. Um, and um, I suppose this, this sort of leads into a sort of a joint question, really, in terms of thinking about the certification standards um, like LeafMark and, and like Pasture for Life. Um, Lucy, if I start with you, how, how, how can they help UK agriculture become more competitive uh, post-Brexit? I think transparency and robustness in really evidencing um, the good things that, as I said, are already being done, as, as well as um, aspiring to where we want to get to. I think uh, in terms of showcasing best practice and having a basis to then evidence what best practice already exists, to build on that, um, I, I, I think that 
that can only be a good thing. I think as terms of um, international com competition, if, if that's the, the, the um, tone of the question, then I think as soon as you're removed from a landscape, it's very hard to appreciate what best practice is there. And if there's a standard that can be trusted, a robust and trustworthy standard that can assure you, then um, I think as, as a concerned consumer, you, you, you're in a good place to investigate and then take that forward in your purchasing habits. Uh, Russ, your thoughts on sort of post-Brexit and how, how, how uh, you know, how Pasture for Life can help? Sure. Well, a really fundamental part of what we advocate and, and similar with regenerative agriculture as a whole is that it builds resilience and that builds resilience in our system for uh, trade changes, changes in trade trends and, and, and price impact, but also climatically as well. And we're seeing that as perhaps an even bigger challenge than, than post-Brexit is how we adapt to the climate. And the last nine months have been a perfect example of that. And we've had a very busy chat on our members forum this morning about how we're suddenly adapting to a drought situation. And we're finding that a, that a biodiverse pastures and a resilient approach actually is what, what can help us weather those storms. And that's something we fundamentally encourage. And, and I suppose that, that's a really good point. I mean, we, we're, as you say, the last nine months, we've seen, I think, the wettest February on record. We've seen the sunniest April, and now we're looking at the driest May. Um, I suppose, uh, I mean, Russ, your, your thoughts are that, you know, that's giving, you know, you're, you're building resilience into those systems through, through, through the work you're doing. Lucy, would you say, say the same? Are your, are your farmers as resilient? Absolutely. I think the work that Pasture for Life is doing will, will chime very strongly with a lot of livestock farmers who are, who, are, who are practicing or working towards or interested in lease mark. I think that diversity is the key to stability and that's absolutely part of our message. It's, um, I think resilience, as, as we've spoken about, means being ready for whatever happens and, you know, we never quite know what that's going to be. Um, but. I think both what Russ has spoken about in terms of livestock and grass and, and cropping and, and what we're looking at in a sort of even more cross-sectoral way, absolutely, the, 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 the pursuit of resilience underpins both those ethos, I, I would say. Yeah. Um, just thinking about the barriers to sustainable land management, um, what, what, what barriers do you feel are out there for people getting involved and, and for farmers changing their their farming practices. Why? Why? Don't, why aren't more people signing up? So, if I go to if I go to Lucy first, and then Russ. Um, I think. Well, we ha we had a quick survey about this as part of our Elms trial. We asked everyone who who joined um, up with the interest of moving from red tractor towards leaf mark. And you know, we we, we asked as a question, what 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 are your biggest fears about this? You know, what stops you? What are the barriers to and um, taking this step? Um, and time is the largest. The time always. You know, change can take time. Um, and cost, whether that be through time or whether it be through resources. And I think uh, that the overcoming that barrier is that long term view. It's really um, kind of the understanding that although there's an element of time, that's time saved. You know, that's time saved, not time cost over, you know, even a relatively short time frame. And Russ, your, your thoughts on the barriers? Yeah, it's a really uh, good question. And our own our own view is that it's it's really about knowledge and confidence and farmers that decide they want to change it can really take time to find all the right tools that they have but i'm involved in a uh, quite a large european project that's actually looking at this uh, wearing my own hat and um, I, I happen to have by hand this i don't know if you can see on camera but this is a sort of farmer uh, morale curve that shows how they how it's quite normal sort of going ups and downs as, as new knowledge develops and new confidence builds and so as a community of farmers we really encourage uh, knowledge sharing so that people can feel empowered to make changes and that seems to be very successful and to the extent that a European project's looking at more of this in more detail. And, and, that, and that message of seeing is believing which I think I've, we've, we've talked about a number of times in these webinars it's actually you know having the ability for people to see see what it looks like and, and, and go and touch it and, and, and uh, understand it in greater detail I think is 
the way that you can change mindsets. It's so important. So final point, just a very quick uh, sort of um, speaker poll, if I can call it that. Is it time to bring all of our environmentally friendly, our nature friendly labels under a single banner that the consumer can get behind, understand and purchase in large numbers? Russ, let's go for you first. Okay, um, I think it's a really good question. And I think the Sustainable Food Trust are doing some great work to really explore how a, how a common matrix could, could work across a number of uh, all, all food labels. My only other thought on that, in my experience, is that there, as well as there are many different types of farming systems, there are many types of different types of consumers, and they buy for different reasons, they have different values, and so different labels actually appeal to them in different ways. And in some ways, there is a need for a multitude of labels to appeal to the variety of consumers that we have. And that's a really healthy thing. It's really good that we have diversity in consumers and in farming. Brilliant. And Lucy? I, I agree with Russ. I think there's a there's a range of priorities, there's a range of agendas, and I think to, um, I think conversation between assurance schemes is very important. I'm at a, a level of parity, even, but I think positively, different schemes and different labels will focus on different areas of um, land husbandry, and I, I think that's a good thing as well. But I look forward to continuing to work together with the full spectrum of assurance. You know, it's very much something that we do do at LEAF and will continue to do going forward. Brilliant. Thank you both. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both for your time today. Uh, thank you to everybody that's joined us today for today's webinar. Uh, we will have a recording of the session uh, up on our website. We've also got, uh, we'll have detailed answers uh, from our panellists today uh, in due course. They'll have an opportunity to answer all of the questions that have been asked. Um, we've also got our roundtable discussions, which you can find more details of the schedule of those. Uh, next week's seminar is on uh, focusing on membership bodies in the land management sector uh, and, and their thoughts. And we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible next week. Uh, continue to share this to your wider networks. We're growing that 2,000 person brain, which is great. Um, thank you again to, to Lucy and to Russ. And it's a goodbye from Tim and from me. And we will hopefully see you all next week. Thank you.